Well, welcome home, church. It is so good to see you, and it is good to be in the midst of God's people today. Uh, last week, we wrapped up our sermon series on indispensable relationships, and today, today we are starting a new sermon series called Unmentionables, and it is the things that I'm going to let Pastor Mark talk about because I don't want to talk about them, because, but we know that Jesus talked about them, so we should talk about them as a church too, and it'll be good, and uh, we yeah, we are so blessed to be able to be together. Uh, for those who are watching online, we're glad to have you here as well. All right, before we get started, let's go ahead and take a look at what's going on in the days and weeks ahead with the Weekly Blueprint. Welcome home, church. It's a blessing to be able to gather and worship with you today, both online and here at SPL. At St. Paul's, we are on mission as God-loving, home-building world changers, and each of you are important to this mission. So let's seize the opportunities before us right now to grow and do the work for His kingdom. Church, I hope that you have taken the opportunity this month to learn more about the ministry of Safe Families and how God desires for you to respond. How amazing it is to not only be able to come alongside a family in need, build them up through care and support, and share the love of Christ, but also be able to show our own kids and the next generation love and serving in action. I encourage you to connect with our local Safe Families leaders, Ariana Shelton and Marla Galka, via the Safe Families at SPL Connect form, available to you at spldecatur.org. You can also find more Safe Families resources and information about our needs for the care closet in the latest news section of our site. Friends, you have the opportunity to make an impact on people medically in need in our community by participating in the Red Cross Blood Drive this month at SPL. Our Lutheran School Association is hosting a blood drive here in room 122 on Thursday, July 30th from 12.30 to 5.30 p.m. You do need to make an appointment ahead of time, so please contact Tina Lichtenberger, 217-520-1050, or visit redcrossblood.org for details and current procedures. We're all in this together, so consider scheduling your appointment today. We continue to consider all the ways we can keep you and your family safe and healthy while also connecting and growing in community. Right now on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m., you can be a part of pastor's class and explore the Psalms of Summer, either in person in the dining room or online via Zoom. Then beginning August 1st, we will be able to provide an additional layer of support to families with young children during in-person worship with the reopening of our nursery. Then August 2nd, we will offer SPL Kids worship in the dining room during message time at the 10.30 a.m. service. Youth in grades seven through 12 will also be gathering Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. in the loft beginning August 2nd. More information and what to expect will be shared with you and your family in the week ahead. In the meantime, let us know you are worshiping with us today by completing the Worship Attendance Connect card online and discover all of the information you need for the week inside your worship guide. Find these and other resources just for you at spldecatur.org slash church online. Even more is available to you as you follow SPL Decatur on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. That's all I have for you. So let's see what God is going to do. It's time to get on your feet, church, and get ready to worship. Welcome home, church. Welcome home. Hey, thank you. We're excited to worship with you tonight, starting this new sermon series. But you know, last week we talked about everybody needs a place. And I am so glad that we are together. Whether you're at home, you are with us. If you're here in the room, you are certainly with me, with us, with this group. And we're excited to worship and to lift up Jesus together. Um, tonight, this might be a challenging word for all of us. And I pray that for each one of us, God will speak into your life, into your heart, exactly what you need to hear to be encouraged and to walk more closely with God. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, breathe on us your word, your life-giving word. Help us to hear it with these ears. And Lord God, teach us as you taught your disciples. We sit at your feet to learn from you. Lord God, let us hear you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship him together.
Almighty God, how true that is. Our hearts need surgeons and our, our soul needs you, our friend. And all too often we go looking to some other surgeon. We look to some other place to, to forgive us our sins and to fix us. And all too often we go to somebody else, to some other place to find our friend, to find our heart's companion. And all too often when we just need our Heavenly Father, we, we run to different things, to different idols. And so, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We pray that you would make us new. Heal us. And Almighty Father, we know that you are the light of the world. You are the one that, that, that takes our brokenness and makes us new. And so, Lord, we pray for our hearts, that you would, you would make our hearts new. We pray for our, our church, that you would make our char church new. We pray for our community, that you would heal the brokenness and the, the shame and the hurt that's found in our community. Jesus, we pray for, for the families of this community, of this neighborhood. We pray that you would bring healing to broken families. And Lord, we lift up the ministry of safe families. That you would work through them. And that you would work through us to bring healing to families in, in Macon County. And Almighty God, we pray for, for healing, for physical healing, for those in our midst who are hurting. We pray for healing for Lincoln Canada and for Sherry Grinninger. We lift up Pastor Gary and Sam McGrath, Teresa Glick and Susan Black. We pray that you would bring healing in their lives. That those around them might know that you are the Almighty Physician, that they might see your glory. We pray that you would bring healing. And Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of life. And we thank you for the first birthday of C.V. O'Reilly, the granddaughter of Connie and Doug Cole. And Lord, we thank you for the 10th wedding anniversary of Mike and Linda Hogue. We pray that you would use them to shine your light into this broken world. And Almighty God, today we lift up our church. We pray that you would, you would bring leadership and wisdom and guidance to the call committee as they seek out a new senior pastor. And we pray for that man that you are calling to be our senior pastor. We pray that you would bless him, that you would prepare his heart even now even though we don't know who he is. You do. And Almighty God, we lift up the, those who are um, going to be our future director of children's ministry. We thank you for the leadership that you have given us in Jen Powers. We pray that you would bless her and that you would give leadership and wisdom and guidance to the, to the committee who is searching for a new person to fill that position. Lord, we lift up all of these things to you. We, we know that you are good and we are bold to pray the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated. 
at home, you can be seated too. I know you were standing up and praising our God with us. I want to take a moment uh, as we move into our time of offering to thank, uh, to thank you all, our church family, for continuing to be faithful in, uh, in providing um, through our tithes and offerings. And I would encourage you, um, as we continue to go through this year, continue to be faithful. Continue to uh, uh, tithe and continue to give your offerings over. That is a, a spiritual practice that we have here at, at church. And it seems strange. It seems um, not normal to other people to, to continue to give, but that is what God calls us to do. And he calls us to give back to him uh, what he has given to us. If uh, you would like to give, if you would like to tithe, there are a couple ways you can do that. Uh, for those who are online, you can click the, the give link at the top of the screen, or you can go to SPL Decatur uh, and click on the, the give link there. For those who are in the room, uh, you are more than welcome to go and click on those links as well, or uh, you can drop it off in the, uh, the offering box on the way out. All right, let's watch this video. Yes, that is something to praise God for. Uh, those were our preschoolers that just graduated or finally had their graduation from our early learning center here at St. Paul's this last week. And how awesome it is to see uh, just the joy on their faces and to know the love of Jesus that is shared with them each and every day. Uh, I'm just excited to see what God does in their lives going forward from here. Let's pray. Lord, open our, our hearts. Open up our ears to hear, Lord. Especially as we delve into some of these topics that uh, our sinful nature just doesn't want to talk about, Lord. That we would rather just skim over the top and avoid. But may we, as your followers, may we humble ourselves to hear from you, Lord and then to follow after you, to put into action the words, the things that you call us to as your beloved children. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. 
Well, earlier this week, uh, Pastor Bill came into the office, and he was kind of joyful and giddy, uh, and it was for two reasons. First of all, the Cardinals were playing baseball again, so that was one of those things. And secondly, the new Taylor Swift album was set to come out, and he was all excited. If you don't know, Pastor Bill is a huge Taylor Swift fan, uh, and as any good follower or fan, right, I am sure that he knows uh, the words to her greatest hits. He's ready to repeat them at any given moment. I actually know that because I've been in the car with him or I've challenged him on the words and they're right there, right? And like any good fan or follower of the Cardinals, I'm sure I could ask him about the players and he'd tell me a whole bunch about them. Because that's the way it is, right? When you're a, when you're a follower of something, you, you know it's the greatest hits, the greatest games. Well, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you say, I'm a Christian, I, I follow Jesus, he's my Lord and Savior, it would make sense then, right, that you would, you would know some of Jesus' greatest hits, right? What are those things that he's most known for? What are some of the most famous words or the most important words that he has spoken? And you would be able to uh, maybe repeat those, or at least those would be things that you would talk about. And if I were to think of the things that I think of when I think of Jesus' greatest hits, I would say one of his first recorded hits is found in Matthew's chapter, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It's what we've come to know today as the Sermon on the Mount, because at the beginning of this passage in Matthew, it says that Jesus went up onto a mountain or a, a hillside, and he began to preach and teach on these things. And if you know about this sermon, right, you, you realize that uh, it was kind of a radical and groundbreaking thing. It wasn't just uh, the things that were being taught by the religious leaders or, or things that were being taught by those in the world in that day. It, these were radical teachings. In fact, at the end, uh, the people said they marveled at the authority, the difference in which he spoke and taught. And, and he talked about things uh, uh, that the people just didn't want to hear. Again and again, he says things like, you've heard it said, but I'm going to tell you something different in other words, you've been talking about these things, but I know you don't really want to hear the truth, but I'm going to tell you the truth of what you should be talking about as my people. And the truth is, uh, you and I, we would like to think that uh, we aren't like those people in that day, but we're a lot like them. Sure, we might read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we preach on it from time to time, but I think most often these are teachings that we like to skim over the top of. We don't really want to talk about them much and get deep into what Jesus is really saying to us because these are things we don't really want to hear what he has to say about them. Things like anger, sex, enemies, worry, money, and success we don't really want to hear what Jesus has to say. But we need to hear what Jesus has to say. As his followers, we need to not only hear, but, but be willing to be transformed by these words and molded more into his image as we seek to live out our lives for him. That's what this series, Unmentionables, is all about, those things that we would like to avoid talking about, diving into, but Jesus, these are the most important things in ways that he's talked about. And we're kicking off our series today by talking about anger. And I want to start off by asking you a question. When's the last time that you murdered someone? I know you're thinking, okay, you're are you crazy, Pastor Mark? Of course not me, right? I, I, I haven't murdered anyone. Or if you grew up in the Lutheran church and you remember back to confirmation, you think, okay, fifth commandment, you shall not murder, means you should, uh, you should not hurt or harm your neighbor in his body, but you should help him and support him in every physical need. Okay, uh, maybe I hit someone. Okay, yep, I remember that. Uh, so, but that was a while back. And 
Well, maybe occasionally I, I haven't met the needs of people, supported them in their needs. But if you think that uh, it's been quite a while since you've done this, hear Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5 today. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Here Jesus connects not just the act of taking someone's life with murder, but he connects anger and acting in anger with murder. And really what Jesus is calling out is in that day and time there were uh, the people, even the religious leaders taught uh, kind of this way in which Maybe anger was justifiable up to a point, and that point was, well, killing someone. And as long as you didn't do that, well, then you're okay. It's just all right. It's acceptable. God doesn't care. But Jesus makes it clear that using words to attack and harm others, it's not part of what it means to be a follower of God, one who belongs to his kingdom. Using anger as a weapon and acting in anger is just as wrong as murder, and it leaves you to the same judgment as murder. Now, I'd like to say that uh, we aren't, once again, like those people that we understand and, and look different from the world around us when it comes to anger, but the honest truth is many ways we don't look different and set apart. Sure, we, we understand that murder is wrong, and we even stand, uh, on, on, uh, we stand where the world uh, kind of bends on this case of murder, right? We, we hold ourselves, uh, we hold up that all of life is important and that abortion is wrong because it is murder. But then we respond thinking that we're justified in anger toward those who would call abortion a good thing. We act in a way with our words that takes and steals life from others. We see one as completely wrong. We're ready to stand, and yet we find the other justifiable. And we see no wrong with it. We need to look different in the way that we deal with anger as followers of Jesus. We are called not to be, live along human standards, but by the way that the world says, but we are to be uh, different in the ways that we live out our lives. Now, anger in and of itself is not a bad thing. Like any emotion, it happens whether we like it or not. And it is there to tell us something. It is there a way of our body communicating to us. It's there to let us know that there is indeed a problem. The issue is that so often we are poor. Uh, we are not good at understanding what that problem really is. Our automatic response is to assume that someone else or something else is the problem and not us. Though anger is there for us to understand that there is a problem, and there may indeed be times when our anger is against something that, that we should have anger about. It's an injustice. Even in those times when our, our anger may be righteous, 
it quickly becomes self-righteous anger. Anger meant to elevate me above someone else. Can you believe that someone would do such a thing? Clearly, I wouldn't do something like that. There are two main ways in which we tend to misuse our anger. And the first of those is that we lash, that we lash out in anger. This is what most of us think of when we think of people uh, who are angry, right? It's, it's that visible show of anger. It's using anger and to, as a weapon to insult, attack, tear down others, and to control others. And when we look at this, most of us, I would guess, would probably agree in general, right, that lashing out in anger isn't a good thing. It's not right. It's, it's not what we have been called to. And yet, I would guarantee, I would bet that many of you, if not all of you, have done this and felt completely justified in doing it that you have lashed out in anger towards someone and felt no need to apologize in the end. And the reason that I am so sure of this is because I have seen the ways that some of you interact with others, with your spouse, with your children, with your coworkers, with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I know this because I'm friends with some of you on Facebook, and I've seen your posts, friends. And honestly, it breaks my heart to see the ways that you use your anger as a weapon to tear others down, to assault, insult, and attack them, to show your self-righteousness over them. And I know it's true because I've seen it in me. I've seen it play out in my life as I have used anger as a weapon and found myself defending it in the end. One of the places that anger, where I tend to lash out in anger, where it comes out of me most is uh, when I'm driving. Are any of you with me there, right? This is what we call road rage. Uh, We think of the extreme cases, but even uh, when you're yelling at somebody in the car and you're calling them an idiot, that, that is still in road rage. And I don't know what it is about it, but I, when that happens, this, this wells up within me. And, and maybe you are uh, like me in that. Maybe you've experienced that. But I wonder if some of you have ever seen drive-through rage. Anybody ever seen drive-through rage? Now, I wish at this point I was going to continue on into a story about somebody else that I saw, but that is not this story, friends. Uh, In our first year here, uh, there was a time when uh, we were in the drive-thru at McDonald's, and uh, we were waiting there, and and the person in front of the person in front of me, so two cars up, they they get, uh, and they move forward, and, and they move forward in the line, and And the person in front of me was just sitting there. They were just sitting there, not going. And it seemed like an eternity, though it may have only been a few seconds. And the next thing I know, my hand is going down onto the horn. I don't know why, but the rage, the the anger came out of me and it and I can even rem- remember uh, that uh, Jen may have called me out on it, like, did you just honk at the person in front of you? And I found myself defending my actions. You know why I think really that happened is because I actually deal with anger in the second unhealthy way. And we often don't think of this being an unhealthy way to deal with anger, but it is. Some of you struggle with the lash, but there's a lot of you that also struggle with dealing with anger because you stash it away. That when anger starts to build in you, when you begin to feel angry about something, you push it down and try to hold it in. 
You ignore it. You try to pretend that it's not there or that thing really didn't mean anything to you. you it, oh, it's no big deal. But the problem with, with stashing your anger is as much as it seems like on the outside you're controlling your anger, and you may be telling yourself that you have your anger under control, you don't have an anger issue. The anger is still there. It's waiting. And it comes and it oozes out in other places and other, other ways in your life. It, it creates maybe a, a change in your mood. You're kind of grumpy and bitter and, and you may be just kind of irritable. And it often flows out in the places where you're most comfortable. For me, that's with my family. That many times... Uh, Many of you may think, of, you look at me and you say, oh, I don't know if I've ever seen Pastor Mark be angry before. And that's because I've had people tell me that before. And, but that's because I stashed that away. And later that comes out in places, even in my home or other places in my life. And it comes out oftentimes over little things that didn't really matter, that weren't really at the heart of the issue the anger is just overflowing. Now, whether we, we lash or whether we stash, I think the worst part of our misuse of anger is how often and how quickly we justify it. Things like, uh, we, we say things like, like this to justify our anger. Well, you know, the truth just hurts. Well, they deserved it. I mean, clearly they're an idiot. Clearly they were wrong. You know, it really wasn't that bad, okay? I can't help it. I mean, it's just the way that I am. Or you made me, right? If you hadn't done this, well, then I wouldn't have gotten mad or angry. So really, it's your fault that I'm mad and that I acted in this way. It's not just these kinds of excuses that we use to justify our anger. We even interpret and use Scripture to help justify our anger. One of those Scriptures that uh, is often used in this way is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. And here Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your angry anger. Now, many people look at this and they say, hey, look, Paul says, be angry. He's given me the right to be angry. Paul's saying, it's okay, just be angry as long as you're angry for the right reasons, as long as you are speaking the truth, right? That's what Paul is saying. But if we go on just a few more verses, Paul says this in verse 31 and 32, and he says, 32, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, anger, right, and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Let it be removed from you. And he says instead what it looks like to live as a child of God, instead of to act in those things, you should be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. As sinful human beings, we think that we can handle our anger, that we can use it in a righteous way, but anger is dangerous. And the longer that you hold on to it, the more likely you are to do something destructive with it. You may think that you can use anger in a wise way, but throughout the wisdom literature in the, in the scriptures, through Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, never once is anger attached with the wise. Anger is always attached with the foolish. You and I, what Jesus and Paul are really getting at, I think, is as followers of of Jesus. As members of the family of God, we are not entitled to our anger. 
We want to believe that we have the right to our anger, that we can hold on to it, but we are not entitled to our anger. It's interesting, uh, Paul wasn't just saying that be angry and do not sit on his own. He's actually quoting Psalm 4. And in verse 4 of Psalm 4, he's, it says there, if we go back to that original scripture, what it really looks to be angry and not sin, it says, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Now, that, that isn't real clear when you first read that, but how I would translate what the psalmist is saying there is if you want to be angry and not sin, you need to shut your mouth and check yourself, right? You need to shut your mouth and check yourself. Be silent. Ponder in your own heart. Assess yourself. Why are you angry? What is at the heart of that? That's how you can be angry and not sin. You know at the heart of this, why you and I are not entitled to our anger? It's because of what Jesus has done for us. That though we deserved every last bit of it. God chose not to pour out his righteous anger, his righteous anger upon you and upon me for the ways that we had hurt others, his other beloved children, the ways that we had despised and rejected him. Instead, he made a way and he chose to pour out all of his anger upon Jesus there on the cross. Every last drop, every last bit poured out on him as he hung there on the cross dying and as he experienced that complete separation from his father. Jesus, the righteous one, experienced the full wrath and anger of God so that God the Father could act toward you and toward me in love. That though we deserved every last bit of his anger, we received none of it. We received abundant, overflowing love and forgiveness. And that's what God offers us day in and day out, though we continue to despise and reject him, though we continue to hurt those around us. And every last bit, every last piece of God's anger, even for the sins of those who sin against you. That's been paid for by the blood of Christ. And so you and I, the beautiful and yet agonizing reality, is that every last bit has been paid. We are not entitled to our anger because God has already pulled, poured out his anger fully on Jesus. So if we're not entitled to our anger, then what are we to do with our anger? I mean, anger is a feeling that we're going to feel. We can't help that. So what are we to do with our, our anger when it starts to rise up and show itself inside of us? The first step, I think, is we need to pause and assess we need to pause and assess. We need to find a way to, when that anger starts to rise up within us, that we need to stop. And then we need to start to go inward and start to reflect on why are we feeling angry? What is that trying to tell us? What is the problem? Is it with what someone else has done that there is some wrong that someone has caused to us or someone else? Is it that I'm misunderstanding what someone else is saying? Is it that I'm actually in the wrong and I'm just getting angry in defense of myself, of my own pride? We need to stop and assess. One of the main things that I, one of the kind of tools that I often give and teach to premarital couples is, is this thing called a timeout, right? And we, we just think of timeouts for kids, right, as a punishment maybe, but 
When you're you're in a relationship with someone, whether it's a a marriage or a, a romantic relationship or a friendship, right, that one of the great ways to kind of stop conflict, to stop anger, stop that crazy cycle from happening is to be able to have a way to, to call a time out. When you know that your anger is rising, that you say, hey, can we come back to this? I, I need to step back from this conversation or else I'm going to say things that I shouldn't. Or I've even known couples that have kind of a, a, a code word and they usually make it a funny word because that way it breaks the tension, right? You, you say bananas, right? And you kind of laugh and okay, yeah, you're right. Things are getting out of hand but you always come back to that conversation. So finding a way to to stop, to pause, and then to assess. The second thing I think we need to do is then confess. To first of all go before God for our part in that, if we've caused some kind of harm, if we've misunderstood, to confess that. But also to confess that Lord, I I feel like I should have a right to this anger, but I know that you've paid the price. So, Lord, I want to hand this over to you. Help me to give my anger to you, to be able to confess and, and hand that anger over, to let God take care of that. And then you, maybe you need to go and confess to that other person that you were talking to or engaging with. And the final thing is that we need to address. That once again, ignoring our anger or shoving it down, not doing nothing with it, that isn't healthy. That in the end is going to lead to destruction as well. And so we need to find, once we've had time to stop, to assess, and we can come back and respectfully engage with others, we, we share with that person the issue that we see or or we share with them uh, what we wanted to get that we're not getting. I love this technique that Andy Stanley, he talked about it in a, a sermon he gave on anger. Uh, he uh, had it where uh, if you were in the midst of an argument that uh, you would stop and you would say, you know what part of the problem is? I'm not getting what I want. Because that's at the root of most of our anger, right? Is you're not getting what you want. And it's once again one of those ways to cut the tension, to stop that, but it also is speaking the truth, right? I'm not getting what I want, and then you can drill into that. What, what is it that I'm not getting that I want to get? Is that an all right thing for me to want, or do I need to confess that that was a misguided desire or an unreasonable expectation? If I were to sum this all up, What I would say is this, listen to your anger, but act in love. Listen to your anger, but act in love. And I think this really even applies to us for for those things that we look at in this world, the injustices, things like what happened to George Floyd or or things... uh, Uh, that are happening in our world around us, that we see these things like uh, human trafficking, and, and we look at them and say, shouldn't I be angry at that? Isn't that a horrible thing? And and yes, we're gonna it's all right to feel anger toward that injustice. But still acting in anger is not what God has called us to in Jesus. And so we let that anger let us know there's a problem, but then we go and act in love for those who are receiving that injustice. We speak out and speak up for them, but out of love and not out of anger. I want to leave you here tonight with James, uh, the words from James chapter 1. And James says this, Know this, Let every one of you be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not, does not produce the righteousness of God. Friends, I pray 
that God would lead you, that he would empower you to put these things into action. That as you're in conversations with others, as you're interacting with others in the weeks ahead, that you would seek to be quick to listen, to be slow to speak, to pause even when your anger is rising, and that you would seek to act in love, that you may be a part of what Jesus said in the beginning of that Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And we live as his children each and every day. Amen. Now, you and I know we don't get that right. That though we strive to live as his children, that we fall short of that. And that's why every time that we gather together as God's people, we make a point of joining together in confessing our brokenness and our desperate need for our Savior, Jesus. For his sacrifice that exchanged God's anger for his everlasting love. And so I invite you to stand here and where you are at home as we confess together with these words. Lord, you know my heart. You know that my relationship with anger is not what it should be. I use my anger to attack others and defend my pride. I use my anger to fuel my bitterness and self-righteousness. And then I find ways to justify it all. Forgive me, Lord, for the hurt and havoc I have allowed my anger to cause to others in my relationship with you. Free me from its tyranny that I may more fully reflect your love and truth in my interactions with others. And our Lord Jesus, hearing your confession, he pours out his grace and mercy and love to you again. For the price has been pay paid. You have been set free. You are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Forgiven, redeemed, May you receive this blessing from our Lord with joy. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We've got this new song. We've only done it once before. It's called Sing Wherever I Go. And I think that's a great way to end a service where we've learned how to deal with anger. You know, God's lifting up praise to God. To sing wherever we go is one of those great ways to deal with all of that emotion that we can have. Let's sing this together. Sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I Come on. go. Come on, all my life.
Amen. Hey, thank you all for worshiping with us today. Those of you who are online, thank you for worshiping with us next week. If you have not, if you have never seen Pastor Bill blush, uh, next week is the week to see it happen. Uh, I'm going to be preaching on uh, sex, so that's exciting. And um, you all should come back next week for that. <laughs> Go in peace and serve the Lord.